justice, them what did it we? Justice for everybody, we're losing life over tragedies. Our government working for us, let's unite and celebrate the need. Unite and celebrate the league.
Let's participate and write our future. The Fui Constitution. You speak, we listen. All proud Belizean. Let's take a stand and Belizeanize our constitution. System where they live to we justice for everybody. We lose them life over tragedies. A government working for us. Let's unite and celebrate the need. and good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Leslie Rodriguez and I will be your Masters of Ceremonies today. I also want to thank our viewers on Facebook who are tuned in watching and this afternoon I want to welcome you to um, uh, you Know Your Right discussion session brought to you by the People's Constitution Commission. Once more I must thank you for joining us today. I know it's a Saturday, we have busy agendas, but I believe that being present here today speaks a lot about us as Corozalenos and as Belizean citizens in a whole. Um, earlier I was having a discussion with one of the PCC members and especially young people, we tend to go to Facebook, complain, and rather than participating in these events. So I want us to take this session today to learn from our guest speaker, ask questions, and you know, bring forth ideas that we believe will strengthen our constitution. So I ask for us to stand up as we carry out our national prayer. Almighty and eternal God, who through Jesus Christ has revealed your glory to all nations, please protect and preserve Belize, our beloved country. God of might, wisdom, and justice, please assist our Belizean government and people with your Holy Spirit of counsel and fortitude. Let the light of your divine wisdom direct their plans and endeavors so that with your help, we may attain our just objectives. With your guidance, may all our endeavors tend to peace, social justice, liberty, national happiness, the increase of industry, sobriety, and useful knowledge. We pray, O God of mercy, for all of us that we may be blessed in the knowledge and sanctified in the observance of your most holy law, that we may be preserved in union and in that peace which of the world itself cannot give. And after enjoying the blessings of this life, please admit us, dear Lord, to that eternal reward that you have prepared for those who love you. Amen. Okay, now we will be singing our national anthem. i 
may be seated. Um, before we begin, I must highlight that our event this afternoon focuses on the third pillar, the rule of law, which entails fundamental rights. And this will be presented by our special guest, Mr. Ed Usher. Um, now I would like to call on the head of the Northern Zone, Ms. Ruth Schumann, to give the welcome. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. I know it's a Saturday afternoon, long weekend, but you being here shows the kind of interest that we are hoping to get from every Belizean, not only in Belize, but Belizeans abroad as well, because this is a very, very historic event that you all are now a part of. And why is it historic? Because if we look globally around the world, you'll never find a situation where government is telling you, here is your constitution, here are the laws that govern you. Tell us what is working and what is not working. Tell us what it is you want changed. Not us sitting at the head table, you. And so, I welcome you to this event. It's very important. It is the beginning of a series of educational campaigns that we will be engaging on. And I would like to present our head table. We have uh, Mr. Ross, Cesar Ross. He is the head of the People's Constitution Commission Secretariat. And uh, he is the face you're going to be seeing along this entire process too. He spearheads the whole project for us. Um, we also have our chair who's not here today because he has to be everywhere, Chair Anthony Chanona, who spearheads the People's Constitution Commission. And uh, I will also have the pleasure of um, presenting our own Corozalenia as well, Commissioner Thea Garcia Ramirez, and she and I both represent the North, but that was coincidence because we're actually sitting at the commission representing different organizations. I represent Belize National Teachers Union, and you are representing the National Women's Commission. But it just so happens that we're both from the North, and so we will be looking at the logistics of educating the Norteños in Corozal through this process. I will leave the introduction of our special guest as we move along, Mr. Ed Usher. 
and we're hoping that this is not uh, an event today where you're only going to listen. I need you to ask questions. The Constitution, as we have said before, has not been read by almost 97% of Belizeans. Most Belizeans don't even know what the Constitution say. And that is something we need to correct. We wake up every morning, we call in to the shows every morning, and we complain from the potholes to not being able to get a job, to prices being too high, to everything that we can think of that affects us every day. And this process is for us to see how every single thing we experience just for being a Belizean runs right into the Constitution. The Constitution guides everything that we live every day as Belizeans. And now you are being given the opportunity to not just complain on social media or to your neighbors, but do something about it. This first stage is to educate, is to let you know what the Constitution is about, and then we're going to come back to you in the consultation process for you to then tell us after we've gone through the process of education to ask you now that you know what the constitution is about tell me what do you want to keep what do you want to change what do you want to include that is new so Mr. Ross is going to explain a little bit further what the PCC is about, which is the People's Constitution Commission, which is a huge body of people coming together to get this work done. He's going to elaborate on it so that we have clarity on who we are and what our function is, and we'll move forward with that. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Ruth. And before I feel totally excluded and left out. I am also born Corozal, so I'm also a Corozalenio as such. Second street nerd, the Aguilar family, right? That's my grandparents, or my grandparents as such. So my roots are here too. My touch, as they say, is here. All right, but anyway, um, as, as Ms. Ruth pointed out, I am the head of the secretariat. I am also the director of good governance, and so there are multiple rules, multiple tasks that gets me involved with the People's Constitution Commission and such. No? The government, and this is one of the things that is very brave about this administration. The fact that, as Ruth said, this administration has made the decision to take to the people the Constitution. And when I asked what part, what is it that they want, they told me the whole constitution is on the table. Let the Belizean people decide. As opposed to what Jamaica is doing and Barbados, both of them are going through constitution reform too. But what they did is they picked 14 lawyers and constitutional experts to rewrite their constitution and then present it to the people and say, this is what the new constitution would look like. Belize and, and the current administration said no. We're not going to tell the people what is the annual constitution. We are going to ask the people for them to tell us what is the new constitution that should be what governs Belize after 42 years of using the current constitution. You know, some Belizeans may say, well, that has served us good. If, if, if that's the case, then let's continue on that. If there are parts that need to be amended, then let's do that. If the people want a... The, the whole constitution thrown out and a new constitution rewritten, then let, let that be done. The point is that the administration is saying, let the people decide. They even went farther and said, let's find what are the major sectors of this country that represent the people of this country. And we ended up with 23 different organizations. We could have had more because I got a letter from the president of the East Indian Council, who said, hey, how about us? But there is a certain limit to how effective a size gets. And the bigger it gets, the less effective in managing 
the process occurs as such. So we drew a limit at 25 commissioners as such, 23 different organizations, and, and the chairman, and the government went even farther because some of you all are old enough to remember in 1999, 2000, there was a political reform commission that was um, spearheaded by Dr. Delan Vernon um, from Spear at that point in time, and they went through a consultation. Um, I think they did 14 consultations. We are pro promising to do 14 consultations in Corozal Tongue alone. Right? So that alone is much more embracing of what, we, what, what was done back then as such. And not all of the recommendations back then were taken. So even their report that they did in 2000 is put before the, the current People's Constitution Commission and they are told, look at this. See if these are some of the things that the people want to address, want to deal with as such. But the government went farther and said, let's enact this in law. And they took it to the House. And in October of last year, they passed the People's Constitution Commission Act, right? By law, read through the House, read through the Senate, and ascended by the Governor General. So this gives this commission here a lot more power, right? And it makes it much more difficult for the government to do what it did with the previous political reform commission where some of the suggestions were taken, some or not. This one here is enacted by, by law. And so the government has in the law said, when this comes, if they are suggesting a major change, if the public, if the people of Belize are suggesting a major constitutional change, then let's do, let's go even farther. Let's take it back to the people in referendum and let the people vote and decide. And if the people vote and decide through a referendum, through a national referendum, that this new constitution is what they want, then the government is legally bound to that as such, no? So there is a lot of power in this process. And, be, and because of that, we have had to make sure that the commissioners represent all the sectors of the country, both sectorally, but also geographically, so that all geographic areas of this country get this type of consultation as such, no? And so, Corozal had these two commissioners. Arun Juak has um, Dr. Perlita Aldana and Mr. Fred Ortega and Mr. Um, Canton leading there. And every district has commissioners that are leading these consultations as such. So it is going to be a four month public education across the country, right? That then will produce an interim report as to what is going on. And then another three months of consultation. What changes? Are we looking for as well? What specific recommendations? Do we want an elected Senate? Well, what is the work of the elected Senate, right? Before we decide we want an elected Senate, we have to ask, you know, what is the work? Do they have real significant power? If they do, then maybe we want them to be elected individuals, right? Okay? Maybe they don't need to be. That, that's all up to what the Belize people ask for. Do we want to continue? the traditional parliamentary system? Do we want a, a hybrid parliamentary slash republic system? Do we want to go all the way across to a complete republic system as such? What is it that the Belizean people want as such when it comes to governance, executive? What is it about the executive that they want to reform as such? So what the PCC and the Secretariat have done is they have divided the constitution into pillars of, as, as you have heard. This Today, in the third pillar, that is called rule of law, part of it is in fundamental rights and the preamble. And Mr. Usher will talk about that. Another part of rule of law is the judiciary. And the judiciary's role in good governance across, is the judiciary working for us, right? Okay, did you know, and, and I, I find out even myself as a teacher didn't know for a long time, that the judiciary gets less than 1% of the whole national budget? Less than 1%, and they are the third branch of government. I mean, 
you know, something needs to change there, right? But we also look at the executive governance, right? And under executive governance, we talk about the cabinet, but also checks and balances, right? How do checks and balances go? How do they work? Are they working as such? We look at the legislature. Under the legislature, we look at both the House of Representatives and the Senate, but also the standing orders that they are supposed to operate by. Is that enough to, to make an, for an effective legislature as such? We look at accountability, right? Under our constitution, there are several accountability systems. And so somebody will present on that, right? Then we have the other area that deals with things like local government. Right? That deals with things like the public service, the fourth branches as such. How about that? What, they, what needs to change here? What, what are they working for us? Right? Is the public service performing up to what we want a professional public service to work and to look like as such? Right? Is municipal, the municipal system an authority across this country? Is it effective? Is it working for us as such? What type of reform needs to occur? I come from Balmopan. I'll be honest with you, we have some problems in Balmopan when it comes to the municipal authority and, and, and the, is there a shared power between the mayor and the, the councillors or, or how does that work, right? So all of these types of discussions have to occur, right? All of these areas need to occur as such and so we are going to as has been indicated before, make sure that you have an opportunity to listen to what is in the Constitution and all of the presenters will look at maybe what is working and what possibly could be what they see as gaps as presenters, right? Okay, and, and what could be modified, what could be reformed as such, no? But so there, there, this is a long process, people, and this is one, but we will be here again and again and again and and as we keep coming here we're hoping that you bring more friends and you bring more friends and you bring more friends so that we begin to have a good carousel you know participation and, and presentation at this point in time right okay thank you Let me... thank you mr ross and thank you Ms. schumann as well for the welcome remarks I think I must agree with Ms. Schumann when she mentioned that 97% of the population is not aware of the Constitution. Last night I was watching a part of the session in Orange Walk and I think somebody wanted to argue with Mr. Usher over there. But honestly, I classify myself as that 97 or 98%. I am not fully aware of what's in my constitution, so I hope today we take this session to learn from Mr. Usher the, the um, fundamental rights that he will be discussing today. And I see some youths present, hope we pay keen attention, and if we have any questions, make sure you address them to Mr. Usher so he can guide us further. So now I would like to welcome Mrs. Thea Garcia Ramirez, who will be welcoming our guest speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're all proud Corozalenos, and, and, and where um, Mr. Usher is not, well, we will make him an honorary Corozaleno as well, and so nobody gets left out. Um, I'm also glad to see. Um, some very youthful faces, and I'm also glad to see some not so youthful faces. But um, the truth is that Corozal is a, is a good mix. Um, and while we may not have the quantities that we, of people that we may have wanted, we can certainly have the quality. Um, a lot of people, like you said, don't know what's going on in their constitution. And I think a lot of people don't realize how the constitution really affects their day-to-day -day living except when you know you get into some sort of problem and then oh well here we go and there's a lot of facebook warriors out there and typing on the keyboard and expressing your opinion is all really nice and dandy you'll get it out of your system but does it really do anything it doesn't really do much um, 
we're glad actually that the government and the, and the commission has um, thought it fit to really come and bring it to, the, to your doorstep. Um, I, I do know and I am, I'm hoping that we can let everyone know um, online and, and here that while the session may, may come to a finish today, if there's any other questions, they can, be, they can reach the, the, the commission via all the social media platforms, I, I imagine, and also through emails. You may notice that um, we're big on QR codes, and so all the, the books behind here have the QR codes, and you can scan it with your phone, and you'll be able to have a copy of the Constitution right there on your phone so you have it nice and ready, and you can check and fact check whatever is, is told to you today. So those are some of the new things that we have um, that maybe weren't, weren't available to any sort of um, commission before. The fact that we have technology um, on our side now and that we have information at fingertips. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ed P. Usher. He's a citizen of Belize. He is a graduate of Wesley College in Belize City and the Royal Military Academy in the UK. He holds a bachelor's degree in law from the University of Guyana and a master of laws legis legislative drafting from the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill, Barbados. Mr. Usher is an adjunct lecturer at Wesley Junior College in Belize City where he lectures in public law and law and legal systems. And in case none of you knew, he is also an adjunct lecturer for Corozal Junior College, and he lectures in constitutional and public law and law and legal systems. Mr. Usher was an officer of, in the Belize Defense Force, where he served for eight years. He was a magistrate for approximately 15 and held court in every magistrate's court in the country of Belize. Were you here in Corozal as well? There you go. He served as a draftsman at the Solicitor General's office and subsequently as a legal officer for the Department of General Sales Tax for five years. At present, Mr. Usher is a legal officer for the Belize Ports Authority. Mr. Usher is married, has four children, resides in Belize City, but his heart is in Corozal. Without further ado, Hold it for three seconds. We good? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for those um, very kind words, Miss Ramirez. Um, I have been going across the country. We started in Belmopan on the 7th of July. Um, and when I, get in, when I was first introduced by Mr. Glenfield Dennison in Belmopan, I was looking around to see who he was actually talking about. Uh, these accolades. <laughs> but here I am. Um, yesterday we were in Orange Walk. It was very interesting. There were some very dynamic persons in Orange Walk. And I know Carousel will be no different. Before I overestimate my knowledge, I would just like to say to you that I am still a student of the Constitution. So we keep learning and we look at the Constitution. And as Mr. Ross has rightfully stated, we are going to be presenting in this first phase to persons. If you know the Constitution or you know your fundamental rights, then this will obviously be a review for you. But for those who are just learning, as you heard the statistics, it is frightening, to say the least, that a lot of people are not familiar with the Constitution. But the aim of these presentations is to open the eyes of our people here in this country as it relates to our constitution. So my task this afternoon then is to attempt to impart to you all the basics of the fundamental rights. But it would be unfair to just venture into the fundamental rights, which are found at part two of the constitution. Um, and so rather than just going into part two, 
I would like to just share a few pointers with you all that the students that I teach have over the years asked, and so I decided before I just jump into the fundamental rights that we do some basics so that you can understand um, what the Constitution is all about. So the first question that arises is what is a Constitution? And the response generally, or in a condensed way, is that the Constitution are the basic principles and laws of a country, of a nation, that determines the powers and duties of the state and the rights of the individuals and the interaction between the powers of the states and the duties of the states and the rights of the people. Now, what about this Belize Constitution, this document that governs us to a huge extent? It actually came into law or into effect on the 21st of September 1981. It consists of 163 pages. It has 13 parts, 145 sections, and four schedules. Now that's a lot of information. Some of the students would ask Mr. Oshan, how do we work through it? How do we know what these parts and sections are and schedules? Well, a simple way of looking at it and finding your way around the Constitution would think of it as when you are looking in your Bible. In your Bible, you have two parts, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Each of these has uh, books, Deuteronomy, Genesis, etc. And then these books have verses. Well, similar with the Constitution, it's chapter 4 of the laws of Belize. It has 13 parts and these parts have sections. So that is an easy way to look at it. Now, <clears throat> the first part that I would like to look at is part one. Part one is the easiest part to remember. And so you all will leave here today, and you will not be in that two or three percent. You will be in the, you, I mean, not in the 98 or 97 percent. You will now come into the two or three percent that understands the basics. Part one is easy to remember. It has only two sections. Part one has only two sections. The first section, the most important section, um, in my opinion, because part, section one of part one defines Belize. It says what uh, constitutes this 8,867 square miles. It speaks to uh, the different islands and the boundaries. And then you heard me say there, is, there are four schedules in this constitution. Well, part one speaks about, or includes the first schedule also. And the first schedule uh, looks at what constitute Belize from San Pedro and Key Kaka and Key Chapel and Sergeant's Key and Garf's Key and Hunting Key down south, Pompeon Key in the middle, Seal's Key, Snake's Key, all these beautiful islands and the 1859 treaty and the 1893 treaty and it tells us this is Belize. That is the first section. The second section is also very important and it's the second most important in my mind. And I will tell you why in a few. The second section is called the Supremacy Clause or the Pro Tanto Voidness Clause. And that section to my mind has the teeth you know why? Because that section keeps the legislature in check. The legislature, just for our purposes, so we can follow what we are looking at, the legislature is one arm of our government. The legislature legislates. It makes the laws. The executive branch, which includes the cabinet and the commissioner of police and the controller customs, the executive branch, they execute the law. They also propose his laws. And then finally, the judiciary, which interprets the law or say what the law is. That was just a quick um, um, look at it because one of the presenters that will be coming to Corozal in the near future will actually be looking at and discussing with you all in depth uh, the separation of those three powers. So back to the supremacy clause then. 
the supremacy clause says in its own words what is the supremacy clause all about and so the supremacy clause and i will paraphrase it says this constitution shall be the supreme law of belize and any other law that is inconsistent with this constitution shall to the extent of the inconsistency be void now for a non-legal person they might be saying man there were a whole lot of words where, where, that, where that mean because when i started my legal journey i never know what you mean either so don't feel no way i never know what them things mean the constitution shall be the supreme law of belize and any other law that is inconsistent with this constitution shall to the extent of the inconsistency be void let us then break that down into parts so we leave here today with a better understanding of what the supreme supremacy clause is saying so the supremacy clause is saying here what whatever is in this constitution when parliament or the legislature makes a law it cannot make a law that is outside the four corners of this constitution it has to ensure that it does not contravene abrogate abridge violate it it must be within the four corners of the constitution now to the extent of the inconsistency it makes sense if those words were not in place then when a piece of legislation or a portion of our legislation is found to be void they would throw the entire legislation when i make no sense so the constitution says here we go on bars if only a portion of a, of a piece of legislature is um obscene or violates the constitution then only that portion shall be surgically removed not the entire thing we know our truth the baby as they say with the bath water no how does that work in effect cut us a bunch of words well not really i know some of you are familiar with the unibam case the very famous unibam case or the caleb or that that um that uh fan has decided to interrupt my my train of thought but we are familiar with the unibam case or the caleb orosco case in that case the constitution was brought to task by by the unibam and caleb orosco as it relates to the unconstitutionality of a piece of legislation what was this piece of legislation that uh, contravened the constitution as uh, Unibam and Caleb Orozco were alleging. Well, what they were saying was that here yeah, what? Section 53 of the Criminal Code, which is chapter 101 of the laws of Belize, according to Orozco, was alleged, he alleges that it was contravening his right to privacy and certain other rights, and that he wanted the, Constitu the, the Constitutional Court or the High Court in Belize, at the time it was the Supreme Court, to look at it and to remedy the unconstitutionality. So the Supreme Court, Kenneth Benjamin, CJ as he then was, looked at the section. And in the end, after looking at all the, the, the arguments from councils for both sides, decided that indeed section 53 of the criminal code violated the right of, to privacy of Caleb Orozco. We will discuss a little bit more on that in when we reach to the redress section, but for now we will just leave it at that and then we discuss it later. So I went through part one, which is all like I said, two sections, so that you can have a good grasp of what we are looking at. What is Belize and without section one, then this whole thing is pointless. So section one says, yes, there is Belize. There is a state called Belize. These are the boundaries. This is Belize. And then the other parts of the Constitution says how this Belize is to, be, is to be run or is to be taken care of by the government. The second area that I am going to be looking at and I was instructed to look at is the preamble. What is the preamble? The preamble is the first part of the Constitution, but it is not 
a part of the Constitution as the law. The preamble says, where we the Belizean people want for we Constitution look like. The preamble is that flowery, poetic language. We are as we the people of Belize. We want to have the right to work. We want our indigenous people to have right to communal lands. We want the freedom of expression. We want the freedom of choosing our religions, changing our religions, leaving our religion, going back to it, propagating our religion. We want all these in our constitution. That is the preamble. It says what the constitution is to look like. Now, we looked at part one, and now we want to look at the juicy part, what we are here to look at this afternoon primarily, and that is our fundamental rights. Now, where are these fundamental rights located? They are located in part two of the Belize Constitution. They include sections three to 19, and then section 20, which is the redress section. Now, 3 to 19, 3 introduces your fundamental rights. And 3 says, every person in Belize are entitled to these fundamental rights, which include the right to life, one of the most important li rights the right to liberty, the right to the security of the person, and the protection of the law. That's a very important right. Freedom of conscience, which includes your right to your own thoughts, your right to your religion. Freedom of expression. Freedom of expression or freedom of speech, as we say, is not absolute. No right is absolute. With rights comes responsibilities. And section three, the introductory section tells you that. Section three tells you, it does not say it the way I'm saying it, but it says you have to respect the rights of other persons. So you, no right is absolute, so your freedom of speech does not mean you can come up out here and speak lies about me and, and, and defame me because I have a freedom of speech, because the Constitution provides for limits. One of the most powerful and fundamental and basic rights that we have is the right to life. But even that huge right that we possess has limitations, and those limitations are in the Constitution. Someone in Orange Rock said last night, well, Mr. Osha, the limitations, well, they're like the Constitution, the Gui, right seen at the left hand and they take it back with the right. No, what it is doing, it is saying you have rights, but your rights have limits. It can't be absolute, it would be crazy if you could just get up, I have freedom of speech, and I say anything you like about somebody, degrade them, say all kind of nasty things about them, which are lies. No, the Constitution provides that, no, you can't do that. You have limits to your rights. And those limits are what you will be looking at in the next phase and saying, all right, we like the fact that we have to have limits, but we don't agree with this limit here, and then those proposals will then be made to the PCC. But as Mr. Ross rightfully said, we cannot make objective propositions or proposals if we do not understand the fundamentals of the Constitution, and so this is the aim with this first part today, is to just give you the basic, tell you where to find it, and then you will be able to navigate it just as you navigate the good book. Now, I would just like to, and I've said this in most of my presentations, and I can't not say it to Corozal. So we hear persons saying, and students say, well, I have, what about the right to vote, Mr. Usher? Well, we have to discuss that this afternoon. There is a right to vote. My opinion and my argument is that it's not a fundamental right, however. And then that's where the big quarrel start. What? How dare you say that, Mr. Osh? So students say, Mr. Osh, you actually they say, we don't have a fundamental right to vote? And I said, no, we don't, in my opinion. And I will explain to you why. 
I just said to you all that your fundamental rights are found in part two of the Belize Constitution, sections three to 19 inclusive. Three and 19 is in it. That is where the fundamental rights are found. Where is your right to vote found? Section 92. Make me we just go back to that. Fundamental rights found in part two between section three to 19, and then this great right that we have to vote is at section 92. That, that first of all, that the first giveaway, that the first red flag, as some people say. How you be a fundamental right when part two of the fundamental rights and that did a section 92? The next thing is, when we look at our fundamental rights, it says, whereas every person, part two, section three, whereas every person, if you go to section 92, it says a citizen. Every person includes a citizen, but a citizen not include every person. Because every person includes one person with a holiday, one tourist, um, uh, uh, an immigrant who is not documented. We like to say illegal alien. I don't like the word because oh, it's not politically correct. So yes, undocumented persons. But they are, they are included in your fundamental rights, whereas every person in Belize, the right to vote, a citizen of Belize or a member of the Commonwealth of Nations who has been residing in Belize for one year, for one year. One year. and other conditions precedent when you are born you have immediately your right to life there are no conditions required you're not to be 18 you're not, but look at your right to vote you have to be a citizen of Belize or the Commonwealth and living in Belize for a specific period of time you have to be 18 years or older. You have to register in a division. You can only vote in that division. And if you go to prison, you can't vote. So where is, where is that fundamental right? No, I'm not arguing that it shouldn't be a fundamental right. So a draftsman will have to manipulate the wording of it and then put it in to the fundamental rights, if indeed that is a, a presentation by you all. So the wording, of the, the wording and the requirements of the right to vote actually um, and the area where it's located actually um, instructs us that it is not necessarily a fundamental right. It is an acquired right and when you fulfill all the conditions precedent, citizen of Belize, 18 years old, registered, registered in a particular division, then you, have a, you shall have acquired that right to vote. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that occurs from time to time. You just once you fulfill the requirements, the well, um, I would not. Right. It is if you are a citizen of Belize and you fulfill the re but no, I have to clarify that. If you look at the the. Uh, the section 92, it refers to the representation of the People's Act. And it gives the, the, the parliament the power to, to regulate the voting and voters and so on. And so you'd have to go to the representation of the People's Act. And some people say, well, the representation of the People's Act is another law, Mr. Osha. And, and remember section 2, the supremacy clause, well, yes. But the, the, the supremacy clause is not violated if the Constitution says that a representation of the People's Act may be, may be, may be tabled or legislated. And so that will govern. Last night we had a big discussion about immigration and persons' movement, freedom of movement. And the guy is saying that, well, he threw off the whole thing. Got the man say, um, Mr. Osher, in the Constitution we have freedom of movement, which is at Section 10. And, um, and, but when we, if I go out, out of the country and I come back, they, I have to get a visa for come back. That may throw me off. A visa? But it is the entry stamp. And he's trying to say that that is, well, if they, and they, they, I could get charged because I go out of the country and I never want, let's say when immigration man tell me, you got you, man, when you come back, and when I come back, there was a different immigration man. I know I come back illegally into the country and I need a visa. No, you need an exit stamp and an entry stamp. And nothing is unconstitutional about that. Why? Because the Constitution provides that you can make laws. The Immigration Act, which shall go, but the Immigration Act cannot contravene the Constitution. 
That is what the Supremacy Clause is saying. And that is the reason why the Supremacy Clause is so important. Because Parliament can't wake up willy-nilly the morning and say every Creole man is now illegal. Because the Constitution says, no, this are, way, this are what is the rights of our citizens, it's the right of a Creole man. You can't make being Creole illegal. That would be a fundamental contravention, violation of the Constitution. Because the Supremacy Clause says, this Constitution is supreme. These are the rights that we have. And you cannot just go up and make laws outside of the Constitution. And so this is very important that we understand these basic fundamental rights so that in the next phase, we will be able to, um, to make proposals for change, if any. A right to life, yes. Yes, because remember, remember, yes, because remember what we first said. That's a good, that's a good point. Remember what we first said. We said that no right is absolute and that with, with right comes uh, certain responsibilities and limitations. You have a right to throw a punch, but the end of my nose begin. Your right to throw a punch and right there, right to my nose begin. Unless, of course, with a boxers and I waver. I say, well, okay, you could beat me, half kill me or half crazy me. I waver the right. But, but with rights come respons responsibilities. Now, if you um, feel strongly about the right to life and you think that it should be an absolute right to life, you should never be able to lose your, your right to life, maybe you can make a proposal. But it, it has to be reasonable because the Constitution provides that if I'm in defense of my person and my life, because your right to your life no, shouldn't supersede my right to mine. So if, I'm just saying, you know what the Constitution is saying? The Constitution is saying, here we go on. You have a right to your life. But I, I right. I yeah. Okay. Yes, and so then that's a good suggestion. No, it's in, this is the, con that, that is the, con that is this, that is what obtains in the Constitution. You're just telling you, so that is a good point. So what you can do is record it, and then in the next phase, you can pre pre present it as a proposal if you are strongly, you know, if you strongly believe it. And a lot of people, the British are, the Europeans are moving away from the death penalty. But um, the United States is not moving away. Many of those states still have the death penalty. So it's a matter of, um, of well, true, because of, because of the, because of the, um, the reasonable time, yes. Well, then that's a good proposal. That's a good proposal, you know, because, and that is the, this is the reason for these. So to present what obtains in the Constitution and what persons would like to change, and then the PCC will make notes as to it. Or, and you can also send in your, 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 your objection, like I do not believe in the death penalty. And then, like Mr. Ross says, when it is presented to the people, then if, if enough persons believe, we should not have the death penalty, well then, that could be a change. Okay. Yes. There's only QR code. You can scan it on your phone. Yes. And you can get it. Or you can... Yes, yes, the complete constitution. Or you can... Or, or you can just Google it. Just Google it and it'll take you to the Attorney General Ministry. Just plug in the Belize Constitution and you have the entire, the latest one too. Yes. So you'll have the latest one. Or you can just scan it with right. your camera. Yes. And, it and, and it'll take it there. So you can get the latest version. So those are uh, the right to property. The right not to have your property arbitrarily taken away. And some people say, well, these are my property and I own this. Yes, you own it, but the true, if you go to pro property law, the true and ultimate owner of property is the state, whether we like it or not, the state. And if you do not believe me, do not pay your taxes. Not pay no tax and say, I mean, so the ultimate owner is the, is the state. The state can take away property for, to build a, a library, to build 
a police station, but they, have, they cannot do it arbitrarily, and you must be compensated. And that is also in the Constitution. So they just can't arbitrarily say, you know what, I want your property for my friend. No, that is arbitrary. But I want, we need the property to build a police station. And then the government can take the property and then work out something, perhaps another piece of property for you, or the adequate compensation which is required by the Constitution. Yes. And then human dignity is another one. Um, now, we have all these rights, Section 3 to 19 inclusive. So, persons would say, yes, we have all of them, and they have, um, they have the, the subject to notwithstanding. Those are other words that you want to look at when you're reading the Constitution. When you see words like notwithstanding, subject to, provided that, this shall not constitute a contravention. When you say their words, you pause. Because then they tell you, look deeper. That is what those words are saying. Subject to notwithstanding, etc. But when we see all these beautiful rights that we have between um, section, um, section 3 to 19 inclusive, and the reason why you see the word inclusive, it is not just to use words to make sure we got one more word. 3 to 19 inclusive is there so that nobody can argue that it does not include section 3 and 19. Can a good lie or I say, well, it says section, between section 3 and 19, and that means you don't include 3 and 19. But if it says 3 to 19 inclusive, it means it includes 3 and 19. Come on, good lie, I say, boy, well, we don't got no violation here You're, um, um, because uh, 3 and 19 are included. So that word inclusive is not a Christmas tree decoration, as I said. It actually means something. Now, we have all these rights. But somebody said, but they're not just words, Mr. Usher. No, they're not just words. What happens if one of your rights are violated? As a matter of fact, they don't have to be violated. You just believe, you just allege. Section 20, very important. If you don't remember nothing else on the left today, remember Section 2 and Section 20, and I will be happy. Section 20 is your redress section. Very important as it relates to fundamental rights. Why? Because that is the section that you will have to go to if you believe the following. I will paraphrase what Section 20 says. Section 20 says that where a person alleges only allege, you don't have to prove, where a person alleges, normally when it comes to the criminal side of things, who, he who alleges must prove. And he must not only prove, he must prove we're on a reasonable doubt. And where there's a reasonable doubt, the benefit of the doubt will go to the accused, the person who, is, who, has, who the prosecution has alleged committed a crime. In this case, there's no proof if I allege that one of my constitutional rights has been in the past, is being in the present, or is likely to be, that is very important, you know, is likely to be. Back to the same case I told you about, the Unibam case, some one of the lawyers um, for, the, for, the, for the state said, what is Caleb Orozco talking about? None of his rights yet has been violated. So he has no locus standi. Locus standi is just legalese for you don't have no right to the talk. You have no right to approach the court. You don't have no rights. Because you know your right not violated. So no, you can't approach the court. You don't have no locus standi. No standing. The lawyer for Caleb Roscoe says no. Let us go to section 20. You see how important it is? By itself, yes, they are just words. But people have taken constitutional motions and matters to the High Court, now the Supreme Court at the time of the Unibam case. And the court has made many rulings as to constitutionality. They're not just words, but you have to utilize it. And for you to utilize it, you have to know something about it. You really can't really can take one position about it if you don't know nothing about it. But if you understand it, or you go to your lawyer, your lawyer will definitely understand it, or should understand it, your lawyer will be able to take the matter up for you. One of the very prominent lawyers, as it relates to constitutional matters, 
is um, our present EAG, our present Attorney General, who has taken several constitutional motions to the court and was, and was successful. He was successful in, in many of them. The recent, and when I say recent, I mean recent um, broadly. The Cod case, there was a Brian Cod and Nunes case, similar to the constitutional matter, similar to the Unibam case. And in that case, the police was taking photographs of persons and taking photographs of, of their social security cards or other ID. And Brian Cod and Nunes, um, their matters, they took their matters to the court. Um, Sylvester, I think, if I remember correctly, he, he was the lawyer. And the court, after hearing all the evidence, decided that their violation to privacy, which is a fundamental right, had occurred. So these things are not just words. People say many are not just words. You know, benefit nothing from it. You can benefit from it. Your right is violated. You get a lawyer, and your lawyer will use Section 20 to ensure that your right, um, having been violated, you get some benefit out of it, and the case law, the jurisprudence of the country grows. So these fundamental rights are ours. Yes, I will admit that there are certain limitations, certain necessary limitations. Last night, someone brought a very good observation as it related to COVID. So Mr. Osha, well, when COVID, they tell we um, you can't move when curfew and so on, and that, was, that violated the Constitution. And I said, not necessarily. Section 10, as I said, deals with your movement, your right to move across this country. And you don't need no visa for Corozaleño, or forgot a Belize city, or a Rinjuak, or Cayo. You have a freedom of movement in the country. But then there are exceptions. So Section 10 says, yes, you have a right to free movement, to move across this country without hindrance, but then subject to, subject to the defense of the country, subject to the public um, interest, subject to a matter of health. That is in the Constitution. I don't make it up. It is in there. And so that is why there was nothing unconstitutional about the COVID regulations, because the Constitution provides for it. I would like to just address one more thing. I said that with rights come responsibilities, and I tried to explain it, but the Constitution says it in different words. Let us look at section three, which introduces our fundamental rights. It says, whereas every person in Belize is entitled to the fundamental rights and freedoms of the individual, that is to say, the right whatever his race, place of origin, political opinions, color, creed, or sex, but subject to, remember those words, notwithstanding subject to, see one and then don't come up already, subject to, when you're subject to, check it out because now it is limiting, it does not delimit, subject to limits, but subject to respect for the rights and freedoms of others and for the public interest to each and all of the following, and then it starts naming those rights. So yes, you have the rights, and the Constitution says it. You say, yes, boss, you've got rights, but you know your rights subject to. Your right depends on whether the next man right to. Whether the next man right. So your right is not absolute. It depends on whether the next man right. It depends on the defense of the state if it comes to that. It depends on, boy, your freedom of movement, yes, but we have to write an regulation because this COVID thing, they kill people. And the Constitution says, yes, if it's a matter of a contagious disease, a matter of health, the government can say, hold up, we need some regulations. We know they move past Sunday. We know they move between 9 and night and 10, uh, uh, 6 in the morning. We know they move from Yabra or other areas, like where we deal with right now. No, no, remember the exact areas. Right as we speak, we have certain areas in Belize City with curfew. That, somebody said, Mr. Osho, that is not unconstitutional. No. The Constitution provides that the Governor General can say certain areas are under emergency. Why? Because the Constitution says it can happen for defense and for those uh, uh, other requirements that might, they're, they're, they're in the instance right now with all these killings. And so we have certain 
areas of Belize that is under a state of emergency. Now, the Constitution provides for that, but it also provides that it can't be, can't go on ad infinitum, it can't go on forever. There are certain limits, certain different time frames, certain different um, times that person can say, okay, one well, month pass, three weeks pass, and a tribunal or the court might look at it and say, okay, it could, could go on again. You can't just go on without any limits either. It has to go before the court, before a tribunal, and they say, okay, yes, we're going to give it one, another extension. So, yes, we have rights, but the Constitution says those rights are subject to the rights of others and to certain other limitations. Now, having heard of these limitations, and I know that some of you will definitely go to your Constitution and make your notes and provide your grievances or your submissions, objections, amendments, to the People's Constitutional Commission. We'll do okay with time right there. And now, and now what we want to do now, you have heard me, you have heard these basics. You might have a right in your mind that you want to address or you want me to look at in depth with you. We can do that. We can now look at what your questions are or your observations, and it makes this a better... Um, a better afternoon. So anybody have any comments, any questions, any rights that you want or a little bit more discussion on? This is the time for us to, to look at it. Thank you, Mr. Osha. Yes. We're coming from Belmopan? Yes. From Belmopan? You. I'm coming from Belize City. Belize City. Yes, Belize right. City. Not, not extremely too far, but Mr. Ross. For, oh, read walk. <laughs> Thank you for coming here. Because it's a long trek, you know. Yes. And um, I don't like to travel too far away for too long. But um, you make this thing very interesting. Thank you. And um, my name is Hugo Vasquez, by the way. Okay, sir. And I'm very interested, you know, concerning this, this whole reform process. Right. What I like is that as I um, read all these pamphlets, I kind of take the Constitution to be like a pillar in itself. And I don't know if you um, have seen those communication towers, you know, that hold up antennas and so on, and some of them are guided, G-U-Y-E-D, guided mm -hmm. to hold up. Right. Because I deal with towers like that, and I say that the laws, the substantive laws, are the ones that hold up the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Because um, the Constitution in itself is, is perfect. I mean, it has everything that the people from way back thought about. And actually, I, I like the idea when Dickie Bradley said that God is supreme. He should remain supreme in our Constitution. Because after all, the constitution of God is the Bible. Yeah. And really, all the laws come from the Bible. You know, some are substantive, do not. Or some do this. And essentially, that's what I see the constitution as something that is benefiting for all of us. And if we are made to the image and likeness of God, we have that law within us. We have the DNA from God. So, in reality, laws are made for people who are unrighteous, people who give trouble. I was talking to um, the police department a few days ago, and he says, most of the problems we have that require policing in Corozal, that I'm not saying it, he said it, comes from the villages. And I was wondering why says, you know, like Corozal Tong is like Belmopan after a certain hour, tranquilo. Nothing much is happening. And we got, probably got used to the, to, the, um, to the law when COVID was around, you know, just to keep all the dogs and the cats took their time to go out. But, you know, a lot, the jurisprudence, right? The rule of law, that's, that's your theme right now, right? Mm -hmm. Fundamental rights. Yeah. I believe, is that the theme? The right yeah. The Oh, the rights? Okay. Yes. 
Yeah, and you rightly said, you know, you have rights, but you need to have responsible people. You have a right to own a land, but you have a right also, a responsibility to have it clean. And maybe even the government, government has a right to give us, I don't know, it's not probably put as a right, but we need uh, property. You know, we need to own property. And I believe they would have a right also, to, or a responsibility to make good roads, to have um, electrical power, to have um, water. Uh, in my mind, I was thinking about Finca Solana. I know that place had so, so many years without water and, and electricity, and thank God it's been provided now, and I'm happy about that. But you know, things like that, and, and how, what role does government play, like, as a, is government taken as a unit, as a citizen, as an entity, or is it just government? I, 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 you know, because we are penalized as citizens for anything that we don't do correctly, like when we pay business tax and we pay social, pay social security and pay everything else. If we don't do it on time, we are punished. But why when government does things, you know, what we don't like, I don't see any punishment happen. Are they immune to this? So those, those are rights that um, all of us have and it's pleasurable, you know, like you're driving. I don't know if that's a right, but then if you come out of a bar and you drive a motor vehicle, you should be suspended. And I've seen it, but our traffic wardens, I'm sorry to say, don't work over the weekends because I guess there's no money to, to provide that weekend um, policing, if you want to call it, you know. And um, having rights is, is wonderful for all of us so that we can get along and enjoy our life. But there's a lot of responsibility behind it. That's, that's yeah. what I want to say. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Um, before we move to the next person, I would just like to, um, to just address something quickly with the property. He mentioned, oh, okay. Yes, I just wanted to mention quite briefly, he mentioned about property. Um, and yes, the Constitution speaks to, like I said, a pro pro the protection from arbitrary deprivation of property. And then it continues in its um, in the words following subject to. It says subject to any other law or so, the fines of a court or taxation will not be uh, deemed to be a deprivation of property. It will not be held to be unconstitutional. So again, we have property. We have money as property, we have land as property, we have other things that are our property, but we still need to follow certain pieces of legislation as it relates to taxation, duties, and so on, which is lawful. And so the Constitution says, here we go on, boss. If you want law say you have to pay taxes, you have to pay one fines, if I court order you to pay a fine, those will not be deemed to be unconstitutional. So, again, once you look at the sections that we are discussing today, and you look at them not even deeply, because the Constitution is, is written um, not in archaic language, it is written in language that you can understand, and once you uh, look at the exceptions, you will be able to follow what, exactly as the gentleman said, that with each right comes responsibility, comes exceptions, etc. So thanks for that, Mr. Vasquez. Um, my name is Roger Roll. I kind of differ, right? Um, I believe our constitution is copy and paste, okay. basically. Um, I, I li like that Mr. Raz is there. We, when I was studying, we had this discussion when we were doing political science, and I believe our, the time has come that mm -hmm. we revise our constitution. Okay. One, yeah. we need to remove, the, our, remove um, England. We need to move from, uh, from 
from the Governor General to a President, because basically the Governor General is there only to rubber stamp. Mm -hmm. She doesn't do nothing, and she's on winning a, a, a money, right? Um, I'm glad that the Min Ministry of Education, they are now teaching Belizean studies, and in the second form, students are seeing the Constitution now. Okay, good. They studied the House of Rep, they studied the Senate, and I also believe that we need an elected Senate. I think the time has come for that. My one is basically a comment, right? Uh, will you answer him or can I proceed? Yes, um, that gentleman. Yes. I, I arrived a little late and uh, I may have missed a lot of yes. explanations on okay. the Constitution. But I, I, I think that I want to make a, a preliminary statement here. I think if I'm correct, I think I heard that the Constitution is perfect. At no time, I think we can believe the Constitution is perfect, or I heard wrongly. Yeah. Did you say that? <laughs> um, I, think, I think as people here, we must understand. Right. Uh, I've heard one, I think another problem that he brought up. The Constitution has to respond to the socio-economic, cultural changes of the place. So it must respond to that. And that is why politically we elect legislators, am I correct, mm -hmm. to the House to initiate laws, mm -hmm. to find out, to talk to the people and find out to, the, the, the rep has to be very well familiar with the people and their needs. Mm -hmm. I, for particular things, I, I want to um, emphasize that point. You know, that, that, yes, and, and I think that the Constitution itself opens it, itself to, to, to change what is right. called amendments, no? Yes. That uh, might think providing or asking for, I think, two thirds of, of the, the LR, legislators to the be able to change laws and so on. The alteration section 69. That's right. Yeah. I, I think you can quote numbers there. Yeah. But, but the, the Constitution itself opens itself yes, to, of course. To, to, to be amended, to, to be responsive to, to the people's needs as they arise. No, that, that is my first point here. Another, which I think what, what we do before I leave that point is how much right now do we know how much we need to change right now? The present laws right now, the present constitution as it is, needs changing. We must understand that. Yes. But just come in right now, I met a friend, I said, so we're going, I said to a conference or some, some meeting on constitution. No, you will hear comments from people, you know, yeah. even educated people, six farmers, I think, are not uh, so uh, desirous of, of, of reading, you know, thick books, you know, or, or the laws, you know. So you find that problem. I think this, this is a very good idea and, and should not be done only responding to change, but should be done frequently with right. the people. You know? and, and if the need arises, then to go ahead and change the Constitution. Change it. People first. People first. It's the people. You know? mm -hmm. It's not some authority. It's not the prime minister and all the ministers there and the legal advisors. It's the people you have to answer to, yes. and their needs. Okay, that, that is one um, point. I am, I am very much concerned. I, don't, I do not know how much you covered that right now, but I'm very much concerned as a citizen of this country, and uh, being born in Corozal, raised here, and still living here, and maybe dying here too. But uh, I am very much concerned about crimes, crimes, going through but 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 unpunished you know there have been a lot of these things just recently a boy was 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 i did run over by a vehicle and and, and then people you know you walk the streets that's what we need to do we need to 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 contact the people walk the streets and that's where the rep belongs on the streets 
you know, to listen to the people. And many people are saying that they have seen the driver of this, of the vehicle that killed that child, accidentally, of course, you know, uh, driving his vehicle. What is the comment? At least, at least, his, his driving license should have been uh, withdrawn from him. I remember once upon a time, I was a very young man learning to drive, and I got involved in a kind of an accident where I hit the, the, the vehicle behind, you know, on the back. And uh, I think the, the magistrate at the time decided to suspend my, my driving license for a, for a year. But it's not happening, and people are seeing these things. And a lot of other things that I, I, I think, you know, I, I don't know how much authority you have to change. You are just explaining, I think, things here okay. because, you know, they are the representatives who have the authority or, right. or that legal authority to change, you know? And they are not here. <laughs> so, okay. So I, I am very much concerned about that. In Spanish, I think you've heard it uh, said, impune, you know, unpunished. Many crimes go unpunished, okay? So we want to know. We want to know people have been killed in Corozal and we don't know what happened. We don't know what happened. You know, what was the result? Was the person who committed a crime, you know, was, was it taken to court, what happened? But you still see them driving and happily. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that makes me, that takes me to the other point on, on the Constitution. Um, then, at what point, at what point, what, what is the borderline between, say, the Constitution and, 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 and its provisions and the actual breaking of the law? Because I'll give you an example of what I mean by this. I am also concerned right now because I've been around and seen it. Mm -hmm. Education is becoming very expensive. And, and things are becoming very expensive in, in the country. And I, 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 I've seen this where parents have been required to pay in anything owed to the school. I'm talking about a primary school situation. And if not, then the, the, the rule is from the school, no? That, that they, they cannot give you your report card and you need that to, you know, your grades and so on to go to high school, you know, to satisfy yeah, other requirements. Right. Well, what is the, where institutions, like the police, they can make laws, they can make, apart from the constitution, yeah. but they have to be very careful that when a law is made that they don't violate the constitution. Right. But then how will people understand that? I've seen people in lines, you know, parents, you know, having had to, to make a line at the end of the year because they couldn't pay. You know. and, and, and the worst thing is this, that we are talking here about what the right to education, especially in the primary school. You know, politicians are all saying what? Primary school is free, primary school is free. And that is not true. So these are the things that I think you have to hear yeah. from the rank and file, from the people. And that's only one example. I'm sure that people here may have other problems that they can air out right now and tell you what, what is going wrong. I'm just giving you examples yeah. on punished crimes. Okay. And the other one is, is, is that in school, and that, and that hurts me a lot. Yeah. Because God, we're talking today about crime among the youth, the young people killing themselves. We, we are creating a problem too. We have, for instance, right now, and uh, we are doing it with a lot of sacrifice. We have a community restore in Corozal town where we're picking up children who, who have been denied their rights in primary school. Let's put it that way, denied their rights, and they are on the street without any hope to enter high school. They, those are the people that, that will end up what? causing crime and uh, putting us in, 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 in crisis, in danger here, and talking, you know, well, what's the problem, what's the problem? We know what is the problem. We don't need to bring uh, experts from, from, from abroad to tell us what is our problem. We know what is the problem, but we are not addressing the problems. Governments come in, or political parties come in and go, and you see the same thing going on. Nobody cares. 
And these are the fundamental problems. And uh, that is uh, my, my, my last point, because I have several, I was writing one here. Uh, I, I am a historian. I like history a lot and do a lot of research. Yes. And I was reading recently, uh, this is our history of Corozal, you know, where in 1875, I bring it up because of the change of laws that has not uh, been done. Um, I found out that the, the name of the magistrate was Adolphus at the time in history in Corozal town, or for the district. And um, he reported, if I am correct, more than 400 court cases. But he, he says plainly in that report that out of the 400 cases, 390 cases were cases brought up by the employers, by the masters, by, 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 by the rich people then at the time, by the elite. And about 8 to 10 percent brought from the employees. So what do you deduce from this? That the law the laws are made to satisfy a particular class of people. And that cannot be seen in history. And, and, and that is a fact. You can read your history of Belize and the history of, of, of Corozal and find out that. And that was a, a particular magistrate. Now my big question is this, how much have we changed that law that, that, that satisfies only an elite, a group of people against God, what is what the people in general, the people, the people have been left out. They have been left out. No, that is, I think, our greatest responsibility right now to see where we have failed and we need to change. And certainly we need to change. Okay, I don't think I'll say any more. I, I think it's enough. <laughs> All right. I think. Thank you for that. And um, I will respond to some of your concerns and then yeah. I will pass it on. And. Uh, yeah. As we said at the beginning, for those who may have come in late, this undertaking is historic because as commissioners, we were not selected to come and change the laws. We were selected to come and organize the people of Belize so that we can create these forums and find out from you what you want changed in the law. And we're going to then put this together and present it to the Prime Minister. So at the end of the day, a forum, an opportunity has been created for Belizeans for the first time since 1981 to say what you want changed removed, included in your constitution. None of us are here to change that, nor a bunch of attorneys in a room. This is the first phase. These four months will be dedicated to teaching you what the constitution is about, asking questions, clarities, and so that when we come back in four months, so in four months you'll be, we'll be having all these events over and over until we are clear what our constitution is. And at the end of those four months, we're going to come back to you and we're going to ask you, now that you know more about your constitution and you're no longer in the 97% of people who don't know the constitution, Tell us what you want changed. And we have the responsibility of logging all of this. And then we're going to compile all this data and then we're going to come back to you and tell us, this is what you told us you want changed, included, removed. Is this document okay with you? Then we will go back and say, Prime Minister, here is our report. This is what your people are clamoring for. That's the process. So it's important that we participate. In reference to education, 
I am the representative for the Belize National Teachers Union in the commission. And I can tell you that one mandate I'm coming with is to ensure that after this process is done, we include education as a right because as the Constitution exists right now, it's not in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Education is not a right for the Belizean people in our Constitution. And many are unaware of that. Many are unaware. They assume that it is a right, but if we look at our Constitution, it's not a right to proper health care systems. It's not. We see people dying in Corozal. We saw one of our Corozalenos die from a post, fell right in the middle of Central Park. There are fundamental rights that do not exist in our Constitution. And it's going to be our duty and responsibility to become involved. And I am going to say, you become the prophets, the disciples. Go out there. And what you learn today, share it out there. And the next time we have an engagement, bring, everybody bring at least two, three persons. Because this is the time for you all to really make a yeah. change, not only for us sitting here, but for everybody coming mm -hmm. behind us, this new generation. Yeah. Yes. Uh, on all the social media, you can make um, comments. And I, I would just want to say that the, the educational um, effort that we're doing now will be held in, also in the rural areas. It will be held in Spanish because we need everyone to understand um, what we're talking about. We need, we need to reach as many people, uh, in, in, in this case, as many Corozalenos as we can, as many Corozalenos um, as, as we're able to reach. And so we'll be going not just in Corozal town, but in the villages and in the rural areas as well. So please, and we, I, I see a few of, of my friends here from the rural areas. Please rest assured that I will come to you and ask you not only to, to come, but to participate with us in spreading the, the, the information. And um, I also wanted to, to say, Commissioner Ruth, um, one of the things that is also, I, I see in other constitutions in other countries, for example, um, I think it was Mr. Ross that was saying that the judiciary only has 1% of the total national budget. But in some countries, they require, it's a, a constitutional requirement that certain areas, such as the judiciary, has by constitution a, a different percentage of the national budget. But I would want to say, I see many students here, that by constitution, what we need then is to ensure that education and tertiary education is also um, regulated and says, okay, well, 10% of the budget has to go to UB. So we make those UB fees non-existent. And so we have more people being able to go at least to the public institutions. There's another thing that I, I know, um, and each commissioner has a constituency per se, or people that they're advocating or representing on the commission. Um, I represent the National Women's Commission and in my work as the president of the National Women's Commission, I see day in and day out children who go unregistered. They're 19, they're 20, they can't get a job. They are not registered. And when you ask, what's the problem that you were not registered? They were, their parents were unable or unable to pay the, 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 the institution, the, um, the hospital bill, and so they were not given a proof of birth. And without a proof of birth, you can't go to Vital Statistics and register that birth. And I think that that in itself, that that is something key because you don't exist. You are, you are a non-entity, and how can we leave Belizean-born children and people 
And that should be a fundamental right. I, 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 I'm trying to look and see where it can fit, but you have to be registered. It cannot be if you pay the bill or when you pay the bill. It has to be that as you are born, you are able to be registered as a citizen, as a national born Belizean. And that is something that I see many women having children and they are not registered. So how can you then register your child if you, you are not registered? You have no benefits in social security. You, I, I, I know two young women right now that can't even keep a job because they don't have a social security card and that is a travesty. So with, I, I think you, you have something to say? <laughs> so we have a lot of work, but, but these are things that you need to think about. I, 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 I was going to talk with Rodriguez about that, the fact that it's not a fundamental right in our constitution. Education, something as, as primary as that is not in there. And so yes, but apart from that, I, I do want to tell you, on Facebook, on YouTube, on TikTok, on Instagram, um, Regular email. We have, um, we are on all of those. We have um, accounts on all of those. Look for them. PCC Belize, right? Uh, I think at PCC Belize in some Twitter. Yes, we, we're there because we know young people, you know, sometimes that's what they follow, right? And so we are mounting public outreach to all of these there. And please reach to us through there and any type of recommendation you have, right? Please um, visit our social media and, 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 and get involved, get involved. I want to add just so you see differences. We have a lot of our students going to San Carlos University. The budget in that country guarantees that university a percentage of their budget it's part of their national budget. So they have nothing to worry because when the budget is created by, by government, they know they're guaranteed a percentage of the budget. We don't have that. And so we find our universities struggling and then we're the first to complain. We need to do better and we can create a constitution that guarantees not just education but quality education. I think you have to sleep with your own, you have to sleep with your own eye and you have to read for yourself and stop listening to what other people are telling you. Okay, um, I would like to kind of ask you if you guys can keep the range of, the, of your questions between two to three minutes. Uh, my name is Dimas Sansores. Uh, you were talking about fundamental rights. Yes. Protection of property. Yes. But then you, have, you don't have the right to property. You fundamental have, right to property right in the constitution the protection of the right to property yes right. but not it's the not the right property. to have property right no. the protection of the right to property right so the protection something is wrong there yeah. yes and so and that was also, and that was brought up last night in orange up that person should have the right to property so that is can, a how proposition can you your property if you don't have right to property because you have you you can you you can have property it's not a the protection of the right to property you have your property you buy a property from somebody else, from the government, and then you have the property. Yes. But the right to property is not absolute, just absolute, just as most of the rights. Only two rights. In, under the fundamental rights, there are no exceptions. Servitude. Se have a 
right to property, you have a right to a piece of land. Yes. That's not in the constitution. You, no, you have a right, the protection of your right to yes, property, right. Another thing is, you have to define property. Well, property is not defined in the constitution in the, in the Maya land rights case. Chief Justice Conte, as he then was said in that case, he was perplexed that there was no definition of property in the Constitution, so he had to go to the Interpretation Act, which defines property to include money, etc. So in the Constitution, according to Conte, there was no definition of what property is. And to a great extent, the Constitution keeps it broad. The Constitution does not operate um, close. It would make no sense. You say it operates broad, and then where there is requirement for an interpretation, then the judicial branch will, will inter right, interpret the Constitution. So where anybody argues uh, about something in the Constitution, makes a constitutional motion, it is the duty of the court, who is the jealous guardian of the Constitution, to interpret the Constitution. Somebody brought up again last night in the original act that um, the summary courts should be able to interpret the Constitution. But the summary courts, as it then was, and well, it's changing and today, was that you did, there was no requirement to have, um, a back in the day, to have a law degree to be a magistrate in the summary courts. And the education, you have to understand certain things about the Constitution to be able to interpret it. But Supreme Court judges, all of them, have to be a lawyer, have to be trained in the law and for a specific number of years before you qualify to be a judge. So a magistrate will not be able to um, sufficiently uh, define or interpret what the Constitution is saying. That is a matter for the High Court. Now, however, we have uh, a new system where the majority of magistrates, the new magistrates, must be a trained attorney to be a magistrate. We have a few who are still untrained, who fall in the, um, who are grandfathered in, who was there before the new requirement in the Constitution, but the Constitution clearly says that magistrates are, are supposed to be um, trained attorneys from the time that that was changed. So most of the attorneys, as we speak today, uh, most of the magistrates, sorry, as we speak today are trained attorneys. Thank you, Javier Pitch, uh, a retired teacher. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Commission yes. for giving us this beautiful opportunity. But it's so sad, it's so sad that we are not seeing a representation of what is desired. Honestly, I would have expected to see chairmen, church leaders, teachers, and so forth. Now, we all know that Whenever you're starting a building, there must be a foundation. And to me, this particular occasion is the foundation of what will follow. And if people are not cognizant of what has transpired today, I think that they'll be missing the train. That's to begin with. All right, so thanks. Now, I would like to share a little bit on what Mr. my brother Rodriguez mentioned and uh, Mr. Vasquez. As an educator, I spent 40 years in the classroom, and I know what it is to tell a parent, you know what, I'm sorry, we cannot afford to give your child a report card. I know what it takes, but who, who is providing for the running of that school besides paying the teacher's salary? It comes from the teacher's pocket most of the time. And also from the little contribution that the parents provide. Now the point is this. Many of those children that are denied a report would come from parents who are very irresponsible. And I want to make it very clear. Now, is there something within the Constitution that will address that issue in relation to the parents? If the parents are not fulfilling with their responsibility, then something needs to be done about them. And let me tell you, 
I see a lot of those parents there buying credit for the cell phone. I see a lot of them at the bars during the weekends. But they cannot pay the school fee. It's not that I'm against the child getting reported, you know. It really hurts me when these things happen. But a mechanism needs to be established to make parents responsible as well. You all said, right, go along with responsibilities. So somewhere we have to work something. And it's very, very important. All right? Um, Mr. Rodriguez, may I not mistaken, mentioned about this constitution that needs to be dynamic, to which I do agree. Now, I must acknowledge the fact that the constitution has a lot of good things. And if that wasn't the case, then we wouldn't have had this constitution. But yes, it has to be dynamic. It has to be addressing the needs of our populace. Mm -hmm. One thing I would like to be added is a lifespan. How often are we supposed to do this revision? Because there must be a lifespan. We cannot be changing every day. Then we will not be certain on what will be our rights and our responsibilities. So just like general elections every five years, the same thing with the Constitution. Tell me, give me a lifespan. All right? And it will work. So I, I have a lot to say, but um, I guess we others would like to make questions and give comments. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. <clears throat> yes, um, I agree with you. Um, and our laws, believes, as it relates to holding parents' responsibility, responsible, sorry, they, we have the Juvenile Offenders Act, Chapter 119. That's just an example. The Juvenile Offenders Act is an act that was legislated for offenders who are young persons, juveniles, children. And in that act, I think it is chapter 119 of the laws of Belize, and I think at section 15 of that act, if a, where a juvenile is found guilty of an offense, under section 15 of that act, there are certain things the magistrate can do. There is a fine, etc., etc., And there is one that the magistrate can find the parents, can find the parents to pay for whatever offense or damage that the child happen, uh, happened to have, to have um, been found guilty of. So indeed, what you're saying, perhaps it should be on a larger scale, that's, but, but we do have certain areas of our law that make similar provisions. So I just wanted to bring that up. But you are right, I agree with you that that perhaps you know it should be enlarged yeah, but right exactly okay just okay just mention it just for information purposes the question was that the constitution ought to be revised or reviewed at particular times. A constitution is a living document, meaning that it needs the revision to remain alive. The general rule is that every 20 years, there's a new generation. And so normally that revision is attached to that 20 years. Because with new generations, we see new issues new needs, new cultures, and a constitution ought to adapt itself to this newness. So the general rule is 20 years. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I will always go back to how and why we're here. We're here this time because the government decided that they're going to give the people the opportunity to revise and make recommendations. However, if we know that every 20 years we should be doing this in other countries, the people have clamored for this to happen and governments have to adhere to it. It doesn't always have to be that government decides to give us the opportunity. We are the voices, we are Belize. So we should exercise the right that is part of the fundamental rights and freedoms that we have to associate and to voice, which 
allows us to then decide, let's associate and let's voice. 20 years have passed and we haven't heard anything about a revision. These are the types of lessons that we should pass on to our children so that we are guaranteed that 20 years from now, we're going to have those vanguards looking after that constitution that remains alive. Good evening. Um, my name is Derek Parks. Um, I want to thank you all for coming here so that I could address something that annoys me. The problem that I'm having, that when we have elections and you vote, and whoever wins is the government, I detest the idea that every time a government, whichever one, have to proclaim themselves by party. I know for a fact they have this principal party first. So where are we? Another thing that annoys me is that whoever is our area representative represents every one of us. And I have never heard them go into the house and talk about the needs of Corazon. Oh, that's a minister of indigenous people or whatever may. Corazon is who you represent. Whether they are the opposition or the government, I would prefer that they go in there and talk about the needs of Corazon. Because we always, and it will create a division between us. We hate each other because you believe in one party and I believe in the other party. And that is ridiculous because we're all Belizean. Another thing that I want to point out is that we have the mayor of the town. And he is not respected by the public service, by the police. They're supposed to be dealing with him in the needs of Corazon. He's supposed to be able to have meetings with them to talk about how they will operate in Corazon. And we do not have that, and he's right there. I've been observing this. One of my time spent as a retiree is to tour Corazon and look at what goes on in Corazon. Beautiful country, beautiful district, but we do not have the simple respect for each other because everybody is supreme and we have to come to some point where we share each other. So these are the things that annoy me. I don't know if that can be addressed today, but please, I think it would make a big difference if we start taking this party thing out of our mouth as government. The government of Belize will do this and do that. The government of Belize, the cabinet will send this to the house. The house have something to say, area representative of Corozal, Bay Corozal, not whatever may, wants to put forward a bill that is needed for the district of Corozal. And if we could do that, I am positive that we will know how to come together and respect and love each other. Thank you. Okay, oh, I would like to respond to, to your comment, sir. Um, and I'll say this. Many a times, and I think the gentleman at the back said, we have a good constitution in many instances. We don't exercise or enforce in many instances. And you're right. There are many instances where our constitution allows for certain things to be done, but those who are supposed to exercise that for the benefit of the people don't. And so accountability becomes the problem. How do we hold those who are to be accountable to us and are to serve based on what legislation says? How are we going to do it? And so, you're right. Many a times, things are supposed to happen. They don't happen. The Constitution dictates that it should happen. But who's holding them accountable? And this is the kind of conversation that, you know, is healthy. And when we come back in four months, maybe among ourselves, we can have further discussions and decide this is what we would want to see in our constitution so that we can then hold the people accountable hmm. or 
create better structures to hold the people accountable. So I am glad you're bringing this up and that is what it should be. This is their time to somewhat complain so that as a citizenry we can get together and come up with solutions. So thank you for sharing. I think the, um, the Constitution provides that this has to be an established. Yeah, yeah, I know, but um, it, yes, it is deeper than than the than the booklet, right? It says that uh, it has to be established, etc. So the Constitution actually that is a like a shorter version. If you have a if you have a you have a right to your to your religion. Yes, and um, because Belize is a Belize is a secular place, although, and I just want to bring this since we are talking about that, yes. the 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 preamble to the constitution says, Belize shall be a country which acknowledges the supremacy of God, and some people say, see, that they talk about the Christianity. No, it says the supremacy of God. It leaves it open to your perceptions of what God is, right? And so it is not in the sense, it, it is secular in the sense that the government cannot impose a religion. The government can't make a piece of law that says, from tomorrow onwards, uh, Buddhism is now the, law, the, 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 the religion of the country. No, because Belize is, the law is secular. It, it's secular in that sense that the government is separate from what religion is. The government cannot impose a national religion, but the preamble says we shall be a country which acknowledges the supremacy of God. If you're a Roman Catholic, if you're a Buddhist, if you are a, a Muslim, you have a right to your religion. If you're a Satanist, well, it's, it, but remember the establish, it has to be an, it has to be established if it's going to be if there's going to be contributions of the state for you to propagate it, having a school and so on, but you don't... No, no, I'm just saying, it, the Constitution says about the establishment of your religion and so on, it doesn't leave it it doesn't leave it like without it has certain... I, I can find it and read them for you. No, but what it's saying is that you can make your own school with your own money. And your own, and your own religion. And your own religion. And if you... And if you Yes, but if you but if you have if you have Satan as your as the head of your religion, then it would be violating the 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 first part of the preamble that says a nation which acknowledges the supremacy of God. So what happens to Hinduism? Hinduism. No, that's what I'm saying to you. The country the country is secular. Like will not impose the government cannot impose a religion. So if you have. So if done, you have well, you can no. You can have a you can have a Hindu school. You because you have your different gods because the government will not say which god you are to believe in. Well, then, 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 but if Satan is your god, that is not the god that is traditionally. That is not the god that the preamble Hindu, says, but the right? Hindu, they do have they the don't devil have the god. They don't have the traditional but they have gods. god. They have no. They have. But they have god. Not the traditional god. You know that that we but say I'll, is I'll supreme. Is, is, 
I'll intervene this way because yeah. you ask, can we just open a school and teach? Um, Let me just you um, can. You have the right just, yeah. to adoration of any god, whatever that represents. However, when you further take that to legislation to open a school, there are specific guidelines that mm -hmm. must be adhered for you to open a school. And those gu guidelines then speak to the safety of the child, and safety is at the top. So if a religion is going to create an environment where the child will not be safe, then that would be a criteria not to grant a license. And so, though you may have a right so to is, your God, and answer, you may have a right to open your school, <laughs> you may not <laughs> be able to answer, get so the license to open it because you don't have but these guidelines. And so, it, it's not as simple mm -hmm. and as we sometimes expect it to be but yes you're right you have that right but will with that right as was said earlier comes certain parameters that can end the right there because then there comes the responsibility with every right exists a responsibility and that's where the guidelines and sub legislations come up It says um, at subsection 2, except with his own consent, or if he's a person under the age of 18, the consent of his parent or guardian, a person attending any place of education, detaining any prisoner, corrective institute, or serving in any naval, military area, who shall not be required to receive religious instruction. No, that is if you're underage. So you can't just take a child and say, okay, I, I, my Satan religion, if they are underage, the parents will still have it. But if you go to section three, which I was referring to, it says, every recognized religious community shall be entitled. Every recognized. Now that is broad. And that is where a person might go to the Supreme Court and say, well, I work more Satan. And that is, it is recognized, but then you have to prove to the Supreme Court that so I'm just showing, yes, I'm, I'm not arguing, because yes, you're right, maybe Satan, they are God, but is it a recognized, it has to be, he says, every recognized religious community shall be entitled at its own expense. But, it's, but it, is Satanism recognized? Maybe that will be a matter for the Supreme Court, who is the jealous guardian of the Constitution, and the interpreters of the Constitution, they will then say, what, what. So there are... And then the educational, um, the Ministry of Education with its requirements will also add into that. There's a gentleman who has a comment in the, in the back. Yes. Um, and while we are on, on religion, at the beginning of the, 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 this People's Constitutional Commission, I think it was the opening day. It was the opening day. And the first day, there was a controversy because a person said that 
he should not be compelled to make an oath. And the person was right. And so they, I don't remember all this, they, they, they document that each uh, commissioner of the People's Constitutional Commission, the oath had to sign an oath. But the Constitution and in the courtroom, and, and all magistrates should know, or ought to know, or they do know, that you cannot compel a person to make an oath. The person can make an affirmation. The person can say, here we go on. My religion now allow me, um, and we find with the Mennonites, we find with the Jehovah's Witnesses, and some other religion, when they come to court, they will not swear that is against their religion. And the court cannot compel them to swear. And it's right here in the Constitution. I just want to mention it, since we are dealing with religion. It says, a person under the same protection of the freedom of conscience, which includes religion. At, section four, at subsection 4 of section 11, it says, a person shall not be compelled to take any oath which is contrary to his religion or belief or to take any oath in a manner which is contrary to his religion or belief. And so, in my 15 years as a magistrate, when a person came, and usually when the person is to testify, you say, take the Bible in your right hand, and then some people say, no, I do not swear my religion my conscience, my religion does not allow me to swear, and then the person is allowed to make an affirmation. Simply saying, the, the evidence I will give to this court today will be the truth. They don't have to say to help me God or help me Allah or help me Buddha. They cannot be compelled if they, their religion does not allow them. And so the first day of the People's Constitutional Commission, uh, one of the commissioners said, I, I do not swear to any oath. And it was a controversy because the, the they did not take into consideration subsection 4 of section 11. And so they had to adjourn the meeting in the morning, if I remember correctly. And they, I am not a member of the commission. I am an invited person here today. But I remember. And they, they had to take the document back to the surgeon office to be restructured. And then the person did an affirmation. So again, these are not just words. Persons, persons you can claim you're right. But you can only do so if you understand it. And obviously, and that person was in a session with me. Um, I did a knock session. Yes. Um, I did a section, right, I did a knock session some months ago and that person was in there when we spoke about the Constitution and we did this, um, you do not, cannot be compelled to, to, to make a note and so the person um, was aware of it. And so when you are aware of your rights, you can then um, ensure that your right is, is, is adhered to. Another thing that came up last night in Orangewa was a discussion on uh, Martin Luther King had said it. Martin Luther King said that we have a right to, uh, to argue and to assemble and to demonstrate for rights. We have a right to fight for rights, and that should be a right. But it, under our constitution, it's not in those words, but it is. We have the freedom of assembly, the freedom of association, and we can go. But that is a solid um, argument from from um, Martin Luther King in the 60s, we have a right to fight for rights. And so. So you, you say, it in, so that is a good, um, that is a good proposition. And that is what we, that is one of the objectives. Yes, exactly. But we have the right to, to demonstrate and to fight for rights. Yes, sir. But it, it is good that it, it was not. It was good that it was not specific, because then that in itself now would have. It can't be an. It can't be unconstitutional if it is in the constitution, and um, then that's why Dickey was arguing that the preamble should be in the constitution, but the preamble is not a part of the constitution. It it the preamble are those introductory words to what the constitution ought to be. And so he right. And he so he wants the case saying, here we go on bus, put the preamble in the constitution. Um, I guess when the proposals are made, somebody might suggest it and it might be tabled and taken out. 
but the, as it is, the preamble are just the introductory words, the introduction to the, to the Constitution. Yes, sir. Yes. Right. 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 Well, those words that you just uttered, section one of the Constitution says, remember I told you in part one there's section one and two, only two sections, and section one, subsection one says, Belize shall be a sovereign democratic state of Central America in the Caribbean region. No democracy, of course. Democracy is government uh, out of the whole um, uh, Greek system, government of the people, for the people, um, by the people. So it, exactly as you're saying. And what does that mean? The majority. The majority rule. Someone last night brought up whether we should go republic. And if we go republic, all I said was, um, I was neither in agreement nor against, because that's not my position here. I'm not to say or impose what I think. But I was, my only comment to that was that if we are going to think about republic, we need to study what obtains in the republican system. And um, in proportional representation as opposed to first past the post that we are accustomed to. So I am not here to say what it should be, but that you'd look at it good. Because um, there are certain things that, that are good about republicanism, and there are some um, there are pros and cons. And in our system, there are some pros and cons. So when you study it and you make your, your propositions and you made your positions known in the next phase, the sassy phase, I call it, then that would be, that is where the thing must start to get interesting. Yes, because our constitution is, is the, our constitution is designed fundamentally um, under the Westminster model out of the UK. All right, let me give you an example of what I'm saying when I, and I don't, I am not proposing, I'm not a proponent of a republic, or I'm not a proponent of the Westminster model. That is not my position here. It's just to say, it's just to inform. So, for example, look at the republic system. In our system, we have the, the um, executive, legislative, and judiciary. The legislative, like I said, House of Representatives, um, um, the, the um, National Assembly, House of Representatives and Senate, the, um, the executive, I said, the, the cabinet, uh, police commissioner, customs, controller, etc. Now, in our system, you cannot be a member of the cabinet if you are not first either a member of the House of Representatives or the Senate. That's a requirement. It's in the Constitution. Now, in the, um, in the Republic system in the US, for example, you cannot be a member of the cabinet in the US. If you are a member, if you are, it's converse. If you are a member of the Congress, their House of Representatives or Senate. So uh, that is one change that will, that will, um, will, 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 be cha will, be, will happen when we go, if we go to Republic. In, or I believe we, we passed a law many years ago. So you can't cross the flow in Belize. If you cross the flow, according to the Constitution, you have to go to a, a by a by election, so you can't cross flow here. But in our but in the, in the system that we acquired, the Westminster model in the in the UK, you can still cross the flow in the UK. So so if we go Republican, you have to just study it. You have to see the history of it, how it came about, and what are the changes. And most Republican system, if I remember correctly, like I just said, are they, they deal with proportional representation. We deal with first past the post. At the present time, 15 plus 1. 15 plus 1, you are the government. Proportional representation, the, for example, the one in Guyana where I studied for my bachelor's, um, you provide a slate. And how it works, let's say you have 70,000 registered voters in, in Guyana, let's say for argument's sake. And you have seven divisions. That means each division or each, each vote or member of the slate, each representative is 10,000 votes. You don't have like one division like Freetown, Fort George, 
your, your, the, the person gets a seat if each 10,000 vote is a seat. It's proportional representation. One of the pros with that is that let's say the Mayan community, sick and tired, they don't get enough. And in, so in the proportional representation, they put up their slate. And if they get uh, 30,000 votes and each, and each, each, each seat is 10,000 votes, they have three seats. And similar with the, with the um, LGBTQ, let's say they say, you know what, we don't get. So that system is proportional representation. But then you can have a hybrid, like Israel. Or, or, right, you can have a hybrid like Israel, um, or perhaps Canada. You, I am not too sure, but the Israel has a hybrid. So you can, you can manipulate it and see how it works. In, 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 and I will finish with that with this. In the republicanism, you can have deadlocks. Like what we see in America many times. The president is Democrat, the Senate is, the Senate is Democrat, the House is Republican. So you have to take into consideration all of these um, before we start thinking of a new system. I'm not saying this is perfect. It is imperfect. It was designed by man. And by man being an imperfect being, you, no perfect thing can come out of an imperfect being. So the Constitution is not perfect. But if you listen to the words that the Americans utter in their system, they say, we the people trying to form a more perfect union. Not a perfect union. They never get perfect. And the wording is right. We are looking for a more perfect union. When in a similar vein, we are looking for a more perfect constitution. Um, good evening, everyone. I, first of all, I want to thank the, the government of Belize for yes. giving us this opportunity in ensuring that they listen to the Belizean people. Uh, Mr. Ross and Mr. Usher, I want to applaud you and thank you for coming to Corazon and clearing yes. some very important information uh, to us. I want to applaud the two ladies yes. in the middle. Uh, they represent and they lead two very important bodies within our society. Thank yes. you very much you know, for representing and leading very well. Um, the information that I share today, I always compare it to the Bible. It is very contradicting, or it seems very contradicting sometimes. You know, you read a piece at the yeah. front page and by the time you reach uh, two pages, it feels, you feel like it contradicts each other. You know, so it, this course that you're taking is very, very important. Yes. And I always believe educating the people will definitely make a huge difference yeah. in understanding right now your rights. Exactly. I want to answer, um, he mentioned something about the police force. I can inform you that we just recently had a new OC. And he is working very close, closely with us at the Corazalton Council. The relationship is a relationship that we can see that can grow, and we will work together, sir. Uh, so there is a change on that. Um, I also want to comment on what you said about um, the ministers in the House not representing very well. I do agree, in a way, we need to probably change a bit where, because we all know ministers have portfolio. You know? And if I have the portfolio just for say of education, and I live in Belize City, more than likely, I will look out for my people in Belize City. Right. And maybe something needs to change where um, there is nothing wrong with the portfolios, but we need ministers to also represent their district, their municipalities, because we have local issues. And I can tell you, as a mayor, I can tell you that we do. Right. Or maybe just a suggestion, as the vice president of the mayor's association, give us a little break in the house. I am willing to talk, and I'm sure uh, my comrades in the Mayor's Association are also willing to mention some issues that we have in our municipalities. But uh, I just want to thank you yes. for coming to Corozal. No it will make a difference. Like I said, education is extremely yeah. important for us. I kind of, I think I classify myself as falling um, within that 97, 98%, but I can reassure you that w that will change. And I want to ask everyone here, to share this information, it is very important. Yeah. Share it, don't keep it to yourself. 
as important as it is to you, it is important for everyone else. And I just wish that um, something like this would ha happen more oftenly because sometimes we don't grasp at the first time and sometimes we read something in our constitution and by the time we read it two or three times, we see something different that we miss. Yeah. You know? So I would definitely encourage for you guys to um, come to Corazon more often and educate us. We're willing to listen. I am hoping that at some point also, uh, you guys seek the opportunity to tour the schools, especially the high yes. schools and the tertiary level. Yeah, that is because they are very important now within our society. Yeah. Unless, or I should say, or eventually we would find ourselves still missing yeah. some uh, solutions or suggestions from very important people. Exactly. That's it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Mayor Veos. And, and let me add that about a month ago, before any other school, and, and as an educator, I hear you and I spoke to the ATLIP, the Association of Tertiary Level Institutions, and before any other school, we have visited CJC and CCC, and we spoke to their whole staff as such. We are waiting for schools to start to, to talk to their students. We have not covered, I think, only one other high school across the country, and so I, I think it's, it's because of the work of Ms. Root and Ms. Thayer, we have already done Corozal, two most important um, schools as such, but we commit to coming back and doing our lot. Um, I would like to add to that because, um, Mayor, you gave me the key just now to the door I want to unlock. And for all of us that, who are here, um, I think when you came in, you had a sign-up sheet. It's not to track you down. <laughs> And it's not to, for you to receive any blast text or anything of that sort. But it's simply to know who's here. And if you are willing to become a part of this. Because we're opening the doors for you to join us. This is not a, a up here team. This is an all of us. And... Mayor, we will come to you because our plan is to go to different organizations and that's why we have what organization are you, or you work or you represent because we would love to be given an opportunity to do a presentation for Corozal Town Council, for the Free Zone, for the banks, for every organization. So if you are a part of an organization or you know of an organization or you want because with our crazy ideas I was even thinking of putting a wrong table in the middle of Central Park and just having people sit down ask questions tell us during the busy time and if we can take some of you especially young people I'm seeing you know I am so happy every time I see young people and we train you and you are able to help us with the education process. That is what we're looking for as well. And those who are not so young and are very knowledgeable and have the time to be a part of this process, we are welcoming. So, Mayor, we are coming to you. We're coming to every organization we can think of. Um, we want to plan some activities, maybe at the park, invite the informal sector, those people who are selling from their bicycles, from their tricycles, from their vehicle, from their homes, who are doing Facebook Lives, these people are experiencing the everyday trials and tribulations of being a Belizean. We need to hear from them too. We need to know what it is that the Constitution is or is not doing for them. And so I was going to come to you anyway to ask you to pro help us provide the opportunity to bring, maybe do a market day, maybe do a, a Sunday fest and invite families and, and come together as a citizenry. I think the, the call is here. We are not blue and red and yellow and green. We are Belizeans. 
And this is one undertaking that we must take without the colors. Yeah. We must take with one flag above us, and that is the Belizean flag. So we are asking that you become a part of this process. Don't just leave. Don't be afraid to reach out to us. Before you leave, come talk to us. Ask me how you can help, and maybe you can be the one going to San Narciso or to Concepcion or, or Copper Bank and helping us bring out the youths, have a football game, and at the end, we have a little lecture on this. Let's be creative. Maybe some of you can help us with Instagram and, and maybe a live or a TikTok or something that can help us disseminate information. The last student has not gone without being under the radar. We have spotted <laughs> you. And, yes. and you know, we, we want that you become a part of this process because this is not about us at the head table. We are just simply going to do the groundwork and the logistics and facilitate and do the sleepless nights of collating that information and putting it together in a report. And remember, once we're done, we're going to come back to you and tell us, listen, when we met with you, this is what you all said to us. Is this right? Are we on the right track? Is this what you said? No, that's not. Let's fix this. Let's fix that. We're going to go through that process. Yeah. And then once you give us the go ahead, yes, this is what we want, then we will go and make that final report. So your involvement is key. This is yes. about you, this is not about us. Right. Yes. Yes. National. National. Yes. No, no, no. There no. are 23 organizations. 25. Okay. okay. All right. Um, thank you. Um, there are 25 commissioners. <clears throat> And each commissioner has an alternate, right? So even this Ruth, who is the commissioner representing the Belize National Teachers Union, has an alternate. So there are 50 commissioners and representatives from sectors across the country, right? And all of them are involved. All of them are working. All of them are participating in this outreach. Today, Ms. Ruth and Ms. Thea who are from Corozal are spearheading this. Yesterday, Dr. Perlita and Mr. Frederica and Mr. Cantun from Orange Rock spearheaded there. So commissioners, because they come from across the country, are spearheading outreaches across there, the districts yeah. as such. Because we have to make sure we reach to, to, to everybody. The, the country has been divided into four zones, the north, the south, the east, which is Belize District and the Keys, and the west, which is Bamapan and, and the rest of Cayo and such. But we also have a fifth zone, which is the diaspora. And we have to reach the diaspora and get them involved. Right? So there the is system. work with the, the diaspora system. and such. So it's, it's a lot of work, but it's 25, no, no. I should say 50 commissioners uh -huh. that are working at this. It's not only... No, not in the next, during this four months, we will be coming here regularly as public outreach. So we're not waiting for four months to come back. We are doing a public education, as Ms. Ruth said, and meeting as much sectors, as much villages as we can in the area. That's, that they have taken the job of organizing Corozal as best as they could as such so that we can reach out. So we will be visiting maybe every week as such. In four months, the public education part of it ends and the public consultation then begins. In the public consultation, we want to sit down and get all of the ideas that... The differences where this is the education. And fixing, yeah. Like for instance, right now it was the preamble and the fundamental rights. The next time. The next time it will separation be of separation powers. of powers. And the then next time it will be the public service. Public service. And have okay. different presenters. So over four of the four. No. Right. Well, first of all, yes, that's what we're doing. We are giving the information. 
we are trying to provoke thought and provoke discussion. This is what these four months will be. At the end of four months, we will again come back for consultations. Having had time over the four months and the information um, given to you, you should be able to come up with what your ideas, what, what you want to see in the Constitution, what you don't want to see, what you want changed, or whatever changes, and so you will give in um, that. You will be able to provide that to the Commission and say, listen, I don't like this, this is not something that I like, or I would want to see this. And then we take that from you. So the consultation will, will involve that. Give, we, are, we are telling you what is in the Constitution. We are providing information on, on the big points. You can come to us at any time, at any of the, of, the, um, of the educational sessions, and say, I want clarity on this. I want to ask a question. Then we come back, and then you give us the feedback. It is not, right now it's us giving the information, and at the end, then you will provide us with your feedback. What you want to see, what you don't want to see. Sure. I think that will that will that will depend upon the involvement of the citizens. If you if if you don't want a repeat of the 2000 exercise, then we need more people to be involved. We need citizen. We we are a rare. But, well, and, and I want to say we all failed as. Everybody in Belize failed on that one because it, it is the laid back approach. It is the it, it is revision. It wasn't a consultation. Let me start. But it wasn't a consultation. One one big difference is that that one was a prime minister trying to find out the pulse of the country. This one is the legislature creating an act, a law that demands a People's Constitution Commission do a consultation of the whole country and the diaspora, and the, there, the, you see there's an act, there's a law that sets out exactly the mandate and the steps and what will happen at the end of the steps, right? So it is different than the Political Reform Commission of 99-2000, right? It's, it's, it's different. That was a good exercise. We got the pulse of the country, but this one here is a is is a constitution commission revision. It's different. It's it's a mandate in law. Yes, it is a very clear. The act lays out the mandate. There's there's the Mr. Rodriguez. There is an act, the People's Constitution Commission Act, passed in 2022, that describes completely the mandate of the this PCC. commission. What they are supposed to do, what is supposed to be the result, what is the timeline for that result, who all are supposed to be involved. See, there's a law. And so because there's a law, there's the power of that law that guides this process as such. It's not someone just asking, okay, let me find out what the Belgian people think. No, this is saying, find out what they think, put it into a report, present it to the prime minister, and then, assembly. if it is asking for a major change, then let's go to a referendum, right? So it is a designated process that empowers the people of Belize at this point in time. The power is in the hands of the people of Belize as to what they want with this constitution. Okay. 
18 months with the possibility of a six months extension. Right? We present it exactly. And it goes to the parliament. And then after that, the prime minister has, I think, three months. Three months he's given before he has to make a, a decision on the referendum. Yes. 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 We are on the eight, eight month. Eight month. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, remember one, one of the things I said in the beginning, this is a sectoral commission. We got people from different sectors across this country. A lot of them are in the 97%. They didn't know their constitution before. So the first eight months was a time spent with onboarding, empowering the commissioners to understand this process and how to launch this process as such. Now they are ready and they are starting the public outreach as such. It is extensive, so it's 24-7. We, we will be staying up late nights putting together all of the... And, um, we, remember, we have to use technology too. So we will be launching some surveys, and in those surveys, you will, and it will make it easier for us to collate information, then we will be able to get from you what it is that you want. And we will cater for everybody. If you're blind, if you're deaf, Whatever situation it is, if you don't read, you can't. We will ensure that we get a way to hear your voice. So, for those who will be technologically savvy, we will be providing that electronic form for you to be able to lodge what it is you want out of this. And and the, I, I will pass it on so you can. Let me add to that, because one of the, when, when we talked about electronic surveys, SIB, because we are working, we are making sure that this is very technical, technically prepared, and, and very managed, that the data is managed and very credible. SIB said, but not everybody wants to surveys by Facebook, right? Not everybody wants to surveys by, by Instagram. The secretariat and the, com the head of the commissioner sat down with the BTL management and smart management. And both of them have committed. They are going, we are drafting the link and the message and both of these organizations are going to do a blast. Everybody with a phone will get that blast. And everybody with a phone will open that blast and see the link to their survey. Everybody across this country, right? We'll get that from Smart, from Digi. Both of them will blast it to all of their customers, yeah, right? Sir, that will, we, the commission is this. That's why we will still have these forums where you will come. But we're organizing where we go to meet you too. So it's so not just going to be that. But form. we have to invite people to participate. Yeah. And that's yeah. why I say if you, if, if you don't say anything and you don't, you don't use your voice, it stays exactly the same. And, and we will try to offer some incentives. We're hoping, we're trying to convince the commissioners to find out, you know, that you can win a, 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 a round trip ticket to Miami. You can win um, $50 credit. We'll make sure we get as much of these things. I, well, I do. <laughs> but we will, we're, the commissioners along with us will be looking across the business society. What can you give us to stimulate the public? So that if you, to answer that, 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 that link gives you opportunities, right, for, for many things as such. By chance. It's, it, we are using all the social medias, we are also using all the legacy media. That means it will be, it, and it was on TV with Despierta Belize, it was on TV. It was on radio, 
and it is and and all of the uh, print media are signing up to mm -hmm. to to MOUs and projects so that it will be in all of the print media as such, right? Both their their hard copy of their print and their electronic version of their media as such. so a mandala um, reporter all of these print media all the radios all of the radios all of the TVs are going to be part of this campaign as such. Right. And we are, we are trying not to exclude anybody. Um, last week, Friday, we were at the Belize Central Prison. Friday, Ms. Langsert, our good student, was with us. 500 um, prisoners, and they were men. They, 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 they were contributing, too, and they were asking about their rights and so on. So we are, we are trying to reach, as Ms. Ruth rightfully said, everybody. And so even the prison is not excluded, even the prisoners had their say, and they will also be filling out um, their surveys. The, the director of the prison, Mr. Murillo, they have a library with some computers, and they will be allowing prisoners to participate in that way. So we are trying to reach everybody. I spoke to the prisoners. I, I was a slightly jittery with 500 people. I never speak, spoke to 500 people in my life. But it was a very interesting experience, and even the prisoners contributed, and even the prisoners will be included in this very historic uh, movement that the country is going through at this time. I know that you guys want to stop up now. Yeah. I want to encourage people. I know we have a lot of questions. I'm sorry to say um, how many people, yes. how many people yeah. even pull out the, yeah. the farms. What is the next one? I don't know, I'm not sure. The, Mr. Ross. Sir? What? The, now, bear in mind that, that 18 months and everything is happening at a fast pace. One of the things that we are um, planning on doing is to have a central space where we can be located, even if it's temporary. Um, for us to be able to allow people to know where we are located during this period of time. So right now we're in that process. This week is going to be a critical week for us to finalize planning and going ahead. And um, we are going to be reaching out to organizations and that's why the mayor is here and I'm so happy that you're enthusiastic about it because yeah. we are looking for a central location where it, it is a place where people come in and come out and we can provide that information of what next, what's happening next. That's why we want to work closely with our village councils so that we can use the community centers and reach out to everybody. So be on the lookout at the town council, even though I haven't gotten an, uh, an official okay. I'm feeling it here, Mayor. Um, and the community centers, the village councils. So that's going to be our next step going forward and reaching out to the specific organizations within Belize, within Corozal specifically. We want to go do a presentation at the free zone. That's going to be very important for us too. Coast, yeah, the, the, I saw the officer here. We're scheduling the organizations individually, which is very important police because it's hard as a result of scheduling to have them present at these forums so sometimes it's easier for us to go to them so the police the bdf the coast guard all these organizations are going to be making presentations to them rather than them coming to us so it's going to be a two-way thing like you said i'm thank you for expressing that because we do need to change the narrative we need to start with us what am i doing to make 
things easier and better. So please go out there and spread the word for us. And don't just leave. Tell us how you can be a part of it and helping us in organizing this process. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for your questions and comments. Um, I now call on Dr. Rafael Riverol for his closing remarks. All right, good evening everyone. Um, I'm quite sure that after uh, this presentation, we have all cleared many of our questions and many more popped out, no? Um, well, today, um, I'm sure that the head table made all notes of the concerns, questions, and suggestions given, and on all the input given today during this fruitful and important discussion will all be taken into consideration to amend the laws and policies to be refined over the time rather than to be replaced outright. We end off by extending our heartfelt gratitude to everyone who made it possible and to all who participated in the enlightening Know Your Rights discussion, and also those who joined live stream via Facebook. Your presence, whether physical or virtual, will make this um, educational initiative of the rights of the Belgian Constitution a tremendous success. A special thank you to our presenter, Mr. Ed Usher, for sharing his expertise and passion, enlightening us today on the constitutional rights. Mr. Usher, your dedication and empowering the community is truly commendable. We can thank see the you. passion today. Yeah, thank you so <laughs> much. Together, we're fostering awareness and respect for our rights, shaping a more inclusive future for all Belgians. So once more, thank you to all the attendees, live stream viewers, our presenter, commissioners, and head of the PCC for participating and making a positive impact on our discussion. God bless Belize. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Riverall. With that said, we have ended today's discussion. I want to thank you all for being here today and those who live stream. And we hope to see you all once again at our next session. And tell a friend, and tell that friend to bring a friend, okay? Thank you. Let's participate and write our future. The Fui Constitution. You speak, we listen. All proud Belizean. Let's take a stand and Belizeanize our Constitution. Them what they have to eat. Justice for everybody. We lose them life over tragedies. Our government working for us. Let's unite and celebrate the